a three foot wingspan, weighs about a uh, pound and a half, two pounds. Size of an eagle? Oh, no, no, much smaller than an eagle, much okay. smaller than an eagle. Are they threatened or endangered? No. 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 In fact, if you go well, yeah. drive through Cluiston, um, we've seen upwards of 30 on one road in Cluiston. So they're doing, they're doing much better. In fact, their range has moved from Cluiston all the way to the west coast. Uh, in fact, we have car cars nesting within five miles of the Gulf of Mexico, which is, you know where the celery fields are in Sarasota. There's a pair of nesting near the celery fields. Which We've had a report to also out on Route 70. Man yeah, yeah. Manatee County. Yeah. Care of Arizona. Yeah, anywhere where there's agricultural land, but they are moving in towards urban areas as well. And why? Because there's a lot of carrion in urban areas. Dead raccoons, things hit by a car. A lot, seen, a lot of food sources. I've seen about North Florida State. So. Yeah, yeah. Bald eagle, everybody knows. This is a fledgling bald eagle. This is a bald eagle that just fledged. Many people will mistake this bird for a golden eagle in Florida. I get calls almost every week, all excited. I saw a golden eagle. <laughs> now, we do get golden eagles on occasion. In fact, one turned up in uh, Port Charlotte Rehab Center uh, that was injured at the dump. Dump is a great place, Laurel Landfill is a great place to see eagles <coughs> and study um, their plumage changes. This is a juvenile, this is a fledgling because it's totally blocked. Beautiful. This is um, that, a, a fledgling of that age after the, after the season, so towards the summer. Now what happens, our eagles actually migrate north. We get only a few eagles that stay here year round. Once they nest, our eagles begin nesting in October and November. First eggs are usually laid around Thanksgiving. Young fledge around May, and by June, most of them go up. Um, they, they migrate to the Mississippi Valley and as far up as the Hudson Valley in New York. And that's when the northern um, eagles begin to, begin to breed. So yeah, very strange. Uh, ours, ours nest in the winter down here, migrate up there in the summer. This is a three-year-old bird, probably, probably three and a half years old, still retaining a lot of white, a lot of white, or you can see the white in the head. You can't see the tail, but the tail looks like this, very dirty white. And that's the adult. That's probably a four and a half year old bird. Yeah, four to five years. A juvenile sub-adult sub of this age will try to breed with a female and sometimes drive off a male if he's old enough but will rarely successfully breed with the female until the following year. But this is a full, full adult. This picture was taken down at Bayonne Park. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. Where the old Kmart was by the shopping center on Highway 41 in Sarasota and Beneva Road. There's, yep. a, there's a very, very small park there called Bayonne. And I guarantee you, this tree is one of the most photographed trees in North America during breeding season. <laughs> Because it, off in the distance, you can't see it, there's a pine tree where the nest is. And that nest is approximately 12 years old, mm -hmm. and they've estimated it to weigh um, almost 2,300 pounds. Now, this is the same adult, this is a female. And you can tell raptors, male from female, only by size. They're monomorphic, sexually monomorphic, which means their plumage is exactly the same. But usually in raptors, all the females are larger because they do the nest sitting and the, and the incubation. Yeah, they do all the work. They all do all the work. And that's true. <laughs> that's true of the eagles. Females are much bigger than the males. So they will roost here and keep an eye on the other nest. Now, both the male and female feed after a while. <coughs> This is a cooper's hawk. Someone was talking, you were talking about a cooper's hawk or a hawk that was eating your birds at your bird feed. Well, I was trying to. Now, the interesting story about cooper's hawks in Florida, uh, particularly, is when I first moved to Florida 42 years ago, we were excited to see cooper's hawks during migration because they never nested here. Why are they here now? Eurasian collar doves. Now, Eurasian collar doves look like morning doves. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with them. They're very pale looking, they got the little black line on the top of the head. Those were caged birds that were released some years ago. Since have spread all the way through North America to California. It's a fantastic food source for the cooper's hawk. They now nest here in big numbers. Good news, bad news. So, what we've done is we've encouraged a predator that is no longer 
that was usually not present here. So what happens when that happens? It starts impacting resident species. And the worst resident species this bird is impacting is the Florida scrub jay. Oh. Oh, no. So Oscar Shearer is one of the last strongholds in western Florida for the Florida scrub jay. So what happened, development around Oscar Shearer forced all the scrub jays from out of the park into the park. But what it also did is force all the predators that lost their habitat into the park as well. So it concentrated snakes, feral cats, raccoons, possums, and this guy. Consequently, since I moved here 42 years ago, the scrub jay population was at 150. It's now at 16. This year was the first year we've discovered a fledgling in three years in Oscar Shearer. One, one out of the 16 birds. Now why? It, it, it can hold more than 16 scrub jays. There's plenty of habitat for it. Genetic diversity. There's so few scrub jays that the, the gene pool is so small that there's never any success, success rate. And plus this guy. Are they too monogamous? Who? These birds. Which one? No. 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 Good well, thing. These aren't monogamous. Seasonally, we call it seasonally monogamous. They will nest, they will breed and nest with each other only for one season. And then the next year they will find another mate. Okay, this is the Cooper's Hawk juvenile. Now, if, if anybody you see a raptor or, or, or an excipitor, these are called, because of the long tails, this is the good way to tell a Cooper's Hawk from a sharpshin hawk. In flight, you notice the head extension past the wings. Very prominent, very prominent. Sharp chin. You, you see, if you took a straight line from here, barely, barely goes past what we call the leading edge of the wing. See how that, how far that goes through? Yeah. Now what one? Which one's that? This is a sharp chin hawk. This is a juvenile Cooper's hawk. These are all juveniles. Now, another, another field mark that's really not um, reliable, you see the tail, rounded tail, square tail. Uh, yeah. Now, when they're perched, or when they're in fresh plumage, that's a reliable indicator. But when they're worn, uh, the tail can, can maintain any shape, and it's really not a reliable indicator. I like to use that head extension to identify them in flight. Now, they're exactly the same. Cooper's hawk and sharp shins hawk look exactly the same. same. Same plumage, but size. Cooper's hawk are bigger. Now, it can get difficult because you can get a large female sharp shin that looks like a small male Cooper's hawk. But that head extension is really very, very, yes sir? What's the most common uh, hawk in, in our area? A red shoulder. Yeah. yeah. In, in all of Florida, yeah, red yeah. shoulder hawk. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the devil, <laughs> that's a red shelled hawk. Look how, look how the leading edge is straight on that bird. Right, right yep. Yeah. Now, why do we know this is a red shouldered hawk? And this is, this is the best field mark for both juveniles and adults. A lot of people get this mixed up with a juvenile red tailed hawk. But there's one specific field mark on this bird. You see this? There's translucent feathers. These we call wing windows which lets through excess amount of light that a red-tailed hawk does not. So when you see a bird up in the air, whether it's a, a, an adult or a juvenile, and you see these white flashing wing windows, you know it's a red-shouldered hawk. They're not just white feathers. They're not just white, they're translucent. They're very thin there for whatever reason, I don't know. And there's the adult. Um, you can still see it. Oh, I can see it better now. Yeah. You can see it there, but it, in the sun, it's not a great, there's not a lot of sun coming through it, but you can tell it's an adult by the red, red rusty sides. Side view of the red shouldered hawk. Yeah, that's what that's what hangs around my yard. And yeah. wants and to eat there's my like doves. Small red shouldered hawk. Now there's two populations in Florida. We do get migrants, and we get the breeding population. In fact, there's a lot of species in Florida that we have two populations of sandhill cranes. We have the lesser sandhill crane, which breeds here and does not migrate. We've got the other sandhill crane that migrates as far as Siberia. Wow. From here? From here, correct. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> kestrels. I was talking to a gentleman earlier about kestrels. We have the southeastern kestrel, which breeds in Florida, and then we have winter kestrels that migrate back on north to breed. So the red shoulder is another one, and the, and the best way to tell a red shouldered hawk from the migrant is the head, very pale head. What would be most around this area? Red shoulders. Red shoulders. I, I've been watching some it, mocking, mockingbirds just knocking the yeah, stew out of yeah, this it, one. Oh. It, it's, not, it's not a bird killer because it doesn't have the maneuverability that the sharp shin or the falcons do, but it, it will take squirrels and small rodents and snakes. Yeah. And it will take nestlings, it will take baby birds. So. But you notice this bird is worn as well, even though it's a nice little yeah. I've noticed uh, there's increased activity over the last 10 years of uh, hawks moving into residential areas, and I think it's because of the, the easy pickings of squirrels. Well, what happens is residential areas we generate a lot of garbage. You generate a lot of garbage, you get raccoons, you get possums, you get rats, you get snakes. We, we, we are not really encroaching on them. They're encroaching on us, but we're inviting them in. So we're inviting them in. Um, this is another one of those specialty birds that you will not see anywhere else in North America except maybe the southern point of Texas. This is a short-tailed hawk. Um, big breeding population in Central and South America. And for whatever reason, this bird has moved up and only breeds in Florida and, and just the southern tip of, of um, Texas. This is an adult missing one, one flight feather. This picture was taken at Saddle Creek in the middle of the state. Um, we get both what we call morphs. We get dark morphs and light morphs. Um, the light morph in Florida represents only about 10% of the population. And the other one is a dark morph. This is a dark morph juvenile. And when they turn completely adults, they'll be completely chocolate brown with just some speckling underneath the wings. And this is this bird breeds in Mayaka State Park. Oh. What's the name of that one again? Short-tailed hawk. It's really not a short tail, but they call it short-tailed hawk. Okay, now this is a red-tailed hawk. Now we can. Why do we know it's a red-tailed hawk? This belly band. Almost all eastern varieties of the red-tailed hawk in Florida have this belly band, easy identifiable. Now there's four other different races of red tails within North America all the way out west, and they change different colorations. But the one we get here in the east um, looks just like that. Red tail, the belly band, a real thick belly band, a real dark head. And you notice it's got some translucence here, but not at the tip. And much bigger primary fingers than the red shoulder, not as, not as, um, not as rounded. And it's a, it's a big pigeon eater. Primarily, uh, I don't know if anyone, all of you have ever heard of uh, Pale Male in New York yeah, City. New York City. Uh, red Tails in Love, there's a wonderful book that you'd love to read about Red Tails in Love. Is that the, where they're, they're oh, nested on that building right up? They're nested right on out? 5th Avenue and 79th Street on top of Woody Allen's apartment. <laughs> that male has been nesting continuously at that same place for 24 years. Yep. Now he's had three different mates. That's good pickings. Mm -hmm. And they eat pigeons almost, almost entirely. Almost the time. What's the name of the book? Uh, Red Tails in Love. Fantastic book. Another, another bird. Oh, I know. Moving right along here. This is another bird that only nests in Florida. This is a snail kite. Now you notice, you notice the, the the bill. Very sight, or very species specific. What that bird eats. Ninety nine point nine percent apple snails. Now a snail has a little disc at the very front, and I believe it's called a perniculum to protect it. Yeah, it's per. I might not pronounce it right, but I think that's pretty close. And so, in order to get into that meat to the snail, he pierces behind the perniculum and pulls it out. This is a female. See that? Pretty. Another female. There's about um, forty pairs that nest in a sewage treatment plant in Clewiston called Station 5. That's the male, wow. all gray, with red eyes. And there's the apple snail. Oh. They, they come down to the swamp, and it's got to be about six inches of water. 
and they'll pick up a snail and they'll take it to a snag or, or a, a telephone pole and they'll pull that snail right out with that, with that hook feet. Red feet. Red feet, right. Red feet, red sear, which is the skin around the base of the bill, and that beautiful hooked bill for getting into the snail. Mm -hmm. Operculum, that's what it is. Operculum, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, everyone recognizes this bird, an osprey, of course. Um, Ospreys are very well adapted to diving for fish because, you notice this? This is called the wing wrist, and this hinges. So when the bird hits the water, he can come out. Now an eagle, if an eagle plunged in the water, he would have to flap his wings. But an osprey is able to just flap the very front part of the wings. They can dive with up to 18 inches to three feet under the water in search of their prey. And they do what we call hovering or kiting. Yeah. So uh, a red tail will hover, which means he'll put his wings out into the wind and just hover. Mm -hmm. And he will do the same, and, but he'll have to flap his wings. <laughs> but they get up to between 30 and 60 feet. They have to have clarity in the water of about three feet to see their prey. <clears throat> and then they go into a stoop. <laughs> Feet first, look at those claws. Feet first, head first, and plunge in, and having to keep track of where the fish is going and the refraction, it's unbelievable. That they, that they, and they're 70% successful in the dogs. They have a, a wonderful adaptation on their outside talon. So most birds have talons that are like this. The osprey can take this outside talon and rotate it so he can grasp the fish like this and turn it aerodynamically so he can fly with it. <laughs> if he had to carry it the other way, it would be a lot of wind, a lot of wind resistance. Wow. So they have that adaptation. They also have the ability to close their nostrils, which most raptors do not. Huh. They actually have a valve that as soon as they hit the water, that closes. And most birds, including this osprey, um, have what we call a nicotating membrane. It's like an eye, eyelid, only it's clear. So it protects the osprey when it dives, but it can still see to catch its fish. Fabulous, fabulous creature. Yeah. This is one of my most, uh, my favorite birds in the United States. This is the American kestrel. This bird is absolute, this is a male. Beautiful, beautiful bird. And it eats primarily insects and small rodents. This is a merlin? Yes. Can you go back to that other osprey? Oh, I'm going to steal my picture, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> more than welcome. <laughs> one more back. Yeah. Oh, the osprey. Wow. That's pretty. Why is the osprey so noisy? Oh, ospreys. Because they can't. No, well, that too. But ospreys call for three reasons alarm calls, yeah. um, to call the mate. During breeding season, the female does 99.9% .9 of the incubation and the feeding of the young. And it's the male's job to go get the fish. Now, if the male is not very good and he's not very quick, she will scream constantly for him. <laughs> Sound familiar? Go break the lawn, go mow the lawn. Now, this, she's saying, where's my fish? Only if she has to will she go out and, and, and get the fish. And then there's a lot of contact calls back, back and forth between the adults to let them know where they are. This is a, I'm sorry? <coughs> Kestro? That's our smallest falcon. Smallest falcon. Yep. Oh, it's a stunning, stunning bird. This is a merlin, the second smallest falcon. This is a mean, lean bird killer. 99.9% .9 of his diet is birds. And he breeds, we get this, you know where I showed you with the Bayonne Park where that, where that snag was? Where the eagle, I took the picture of the eagle? This is the same place but a different snag. So these birds breed all the way up in Alaska in the Arctic Circle and they winter as far south as uh, Central America and we get them here in Florida in the winter time. And that was a, a merlin. A merlin, merlin. Right. that's a falcon. Brown on the back? Yeah, well this one's, this one's a female so it's brown on the back. Males are slate gray, like kind of like a crocus hawk. But there's three races. There's a prairie race, which is almost white. 
and a tundra lake race that's very almost dark brown black. Pretty wow. Wow. This is this is the the hunter of all hunters. This is a peregrine falcon. This is a peregrine falcon. Now we do get two or three of these in downtown Sarasota.